And welcome back to Jeff Kunanga live at La Prunia Dora Restaurant at the Intercontinental Hotel today. Tonight, looking critically. That's right, a critical look at the state of the nation following this week's events and the past few weeks as well. Here with me, some critical thinkers. KK, constitutional lawyer and ambassador Martin Kimani of Yunnan and UNEP. So, gentlemen, the attacks in Mandera, horrific attacks in the span of two weeks. First one, the bus attacks. Allegedly, the terrorists get on the bus. They make everybody read the Quran. Those who couldn't, shot in the head. Second attack, quarry, 36 people killed. And the second one, there had been a warning. We hear from the deputy president, Ambassador, you know this, that there had been a warning for people to evacuate, and they weren't. And these people came in, and they systematically killed 36 people. I mean, come on, who's to blame? Who do we blame? What, what are we doing wrong? Oh, well, Jeff, we can start by blaming the killers, right? We can he's, start he's with enough. that. Uh, and it's very important to start with that. Because when you start by blaming the killers, um, it allows us to bring all the muscles we have as a country, the love of country, the concern for community, to the front. And it is that which is going to form an unbreakable barrier. It is that that's going to allow people to say, this guy who's in my neighborhood, I've never seen him before. He keeps shutting his curtains and there's something he's doing. I don't know what he's doing. Someone needs to check him out. That is the first thing. Um, the second thing, of course, is, I mean, I am shattered as much as the rest of the country is, and certainly this government is, about those attacks and those people we lost. Um, our security forces, as the president said, we have to do better. We have to do better. Mm -hmm. That's simple bottom line. Yeah. Now, the thing we remember, and this is not an excuse, is that this is a war without a front. I told you these people are not courageous enough to face a KDF soldier. They would rather kill an innocent worker in a quarry, mm -hmm. or they'd rather stop a bus of teachers going back home for holidays and shoot them. It means that everyone is vulnerable to them. Now, our security forces are working overtime. They're working overtime. Their attacks we're thwarting, and there are many attacks we're thwarting, many we are preventing. Mm. There's intelligence we're acting on all the time. Okay, okay, there's people saying we're not working hard enough, we're not working fast enough, and maybe we're not highlighting what Belosi is saying, that there are thwarted attacks that are never reported. What do you think? You know, uh, the nature of a human being is to look at the glasses half empty. That's the nature of the human beings. But let's look at the issue of Mandela. I am personally skeptic or skeptical about the Al-Shabaab element in that thing. And I'll tell you why I think so. Uh, look at the elected leaders in that place, from the governor, from the, uh, the senator, the woman representative, the members of parliament of that county, and even the MCAs. It is alleged, and I say that with a lot of respect, it's alleged they all come from the same clan. And for us to understand the politics of uh, the, the, the communities that live in that area, they are clustered in clans. They vote on clan basis, and after the election, we had problems in Mandela, if you recall. And when we had that problem, that thing came out very clearly, that there is claims of marginalization of one clan by another clan. Now, that was never solved. It persists. It is very easy to make uh, an educated guess that the people felt they are marginalized. They are local people. They are very local people. Mm -hmm. And they could mount reprisal against the county government because, look, they are saying, they are, they, they are making sure that the people that do not reside from that place, they are out. The doctors, the administrators, the teachers, and what have you. Now, what is going to happen? 
What is going to happen is there's going to be a creation of major void. And that void is going to be blamed on who? The county government. What, now, could, what good does that do the people there, KK, in the, at the end? In, the end? Uh, other, in, in my opinion, I think we need to look at that issue. For me, it's a local issue. I could be very wrong. It's a local issue, but we have a kite called the Al-Shabaab. That's what we have. And that kite could be the one that is being shown, but in reality, it's really a local issue that is needing management by the local government, the, the county government, and also the national government. Plus, mm. and we need to deal with this issue again, we, ha we are at war with Somalia as a country, mainly the Al-Shabaab. What I would suggest personally is creating uh, a 20 mile uh, Norman, uh, what I can call a, a zone. Like a buffer zone? A buffer zone mm. for 20 miles or even more from the tip of, the, of our border all the way to Lamu. And say, anybody coming from that country without proper documentation, he would be treading on harm's, harm's way. Easy for you to say, KK, when they're coming with money. Yeah, just, and that's just, a minute, just a minute. Just a minute. They're you coming with suitcases full of money. Well, if they come with suitcases full of money, then the problem is ourselves because we are falling uh, prey to corruption. There's a lot of compromises. Now, if we do not have a nationalistic disposition to protecting our motherland, then we must be prepared for the consequences. And that is a very dangerous situation. But to begin with, because as I'm saying, I'm not persuaded that he's there al Shabab. You're not? I'm, I'm not persuaded myself, all right? Uh, but if it is al Shabab and they're coming from Somalia, that Bavazun, if it is created, we can be able to police that Bavazun through um, our military, all right? We can be able to use drones. We can do anything. Mm. But, and that way then we can say, Oh, it's Al Shabaab because we'll be able to see them. But what I said earlier on is that we may have elements that are local, and those elements they could be the one that are homegrown. Well, mm. you to say? Yeah. Well, first I wanted to 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 say that um, there's there's a myth, and I and with all due respect to KK that marginalization is the cause of terrorism. It's not. It's simply not. One, um, our constitution gives everyone ample opportunity to respond politically if you feel bereaved by the government, whether it's a county government or whether it's the national government. Now, I have heard it said, and I've even heard it said by very senior people, that these terrorist attacks are some sort of cause and effect, that they were caused by marginalization, they were caused by poverty. But listen, I have relatives who are poor. Marginalization is not a new thing in this continent of ours, in fact, in the whole world. Um, what we have is a network of people who have bought into an idea that they want to change the maps of the world that they want to create a caliphate here in Kenya. And this caliphate, for this caliphate to live, it means the destruction of everything Kenya has worked for. It means the end of our democracy. It means the end of the freedom of the three of us to sit here and talk. It means the end of the freedom to wear what you want to wear. I mean, Al-Shabaab, when they, the areas they were in control of before KDF routed them out, they, were not watch, they didn't allow people to watch the World Cup they didn't allow people to listen to music. This is the vision of these people. Papalozzi, it, you so it's not marginalization. It is an actual um, agenda to destroy democracies, to destroy countries. Yes, but those relatives of yours you talk about, those poor relatives of yours, if yes. they were offered X amount of money, a briefcase full of money, you, don't, you want to tell me they wouldn't take it to join this group, no matter who this group is? You want to tell me they wouldn't take it? No, the issue is this. The, the desperation of people who are having a hard time. There are many Kenyans having a hard time. There's no doubt about that. There's no doubt about that. 
But our country is changing very fast. Opportunities are increasing. Our economy and the goods and services we're producing are increasing. Our educational institutions are increasing and they're producing more and more skilled people. If you look at the world today, if you're the, ma if you're the head of a major corporation and you're looking at your map, you, your eye will almost inevitably fall on Kenya. People are thinking of how to engage with Kenya. So what we have, the reason we're building roads and railways and new airport terminals is because at the point at which all this investment comes, jobs will come with that investment. And so what we're trying to tell Kenyans is we know people are desperate. We know people are having a hard time with their livelihood. But we also know that this country is improving. We all need to collectively reject the idea that because right now I have a challenge, that there is some sort of justification to go join an outfit that wants to shoot innocent teachers, mm -hmm. right? Because after all, what will those guys get? All they'll get is KDF bombing them. All they'll get is the police going after them. All they'll get is long jail sentences. There is actually no hope that Al-Shabaab is selling Kenyans. Mm -hmm. All they're selling those desperate young men is death, jail, and personal destruction. KK. Well, well, let, me, yeah, right. let me just say this. I said alleged marginalization. Mm. That was the argument. But I also think we need to bring in a factor. And that is, when you have people that are desperate, whoever they are, an individual or a group of people, they become capable, they become very susceptible to becoming mercenaries. This al Shabaab you're talking about, these are mercenaries by any other name. That's what it is. You even found them in Iran, the ISIS. Yeah. The Iraq, Syria, they're there. Uh, Syria and um, um, uh, Iraq. You also have Boko Harams who are operating in Nigeria. Now these guys, it is very clear there's somebody who is funding them. And one of the greatest things that needs to be uh, interrogated very seriously is who is funding these people, whether they are Boko Harams, they are ISIS, they are Al-Shababs, or whatever it is. Because without funding, there's no way they can have the sophisticated arms that they normally have. There's no way they can attract people without something in return. So I think that is another an element we should not uh, uh, forget that who is the source of funds. Peggy, I'm glad you mentioned Boko Haram because yes. they've made parts of northern Nigeria ungovernable. Absolutely. Is that the same thing Al-Shabaab is trying to do here? Do they want to make Kenya ungovernable? Now, one, one element, and I think, uh, uh, Ambassador, here we, we need to really uh, look at. If you study Somalia as a country, there's one distinction about Somalia from any other country in the whole of Africa. One is the most homogeneous society in terms of their religion, in terms of their culture, and in terms of language. However, that homogeneity notwithstanding, in their, if you study their, them from the point of view of sociology, from the point of view of genealogy, you realize one thing. If you are a Somali, by the time you are five years old, you are expected to be able to know your genealogy 300 years back. 300 years back. You get what I mean? Now, in this country, whether we like it or not, the Somalis in Somalia, they are not different from the Somalis here. They relate in terms of clans. Because when a Somali meets a Somali, a Somali, the first thing they find out is, which is, you are a Somali from where? Which is your clan? And that's the way they're gonna relate with each other. Now Kenyans, they don't understand this thing. Because to you, what is a clan? It's nothing. But that is the core of the relationship. You are an Ogaden, you are Isaac, Isaac, you are Osman Muhammad, you are a Hawaii, and that is so powerful a force. So you, as, a, as Kenyans, 
we, are, we have to deal with this phenomenon and the narrative of how it relates. And therefore, when you realize that okay, an area like Mandela that is occupied by either two or three clans, if one clan has taken all the leadership positions, the others automatically feel we are not part of this. Mm. Now, it is very difficult for a Kenyan, ordinary Kenyan, who is not brought up with that narrative to appreciate that aspect. And I think it is important that Kenyans begin to study very seriously this phenomenon that we, ha we have. And if we don't study and understand it, then our prescription of the solution or the problem will be very difficult. Well, I've, I've worked all over the horn, Jeff. Yes. Um, and the first thing that's very important is that to me the the culture of the Somali people is a beautiful thing it's a culture that has produced some of the most beautiful poetry and music in Africa uh, I would love the idea of knowing my forefathers for 300 years and indeed if I paid uh, more attention to my mother maybe I would <laughs> uh, but um, it's a beautiful culture it, it is a very rich part of Kenya's culture. Uh, it is Somali culture that allows incredible business abilities because of the, the closeness of those clans. They can generate capital. They can invest. Mm. This beautiful culture is actually under assault from Al-Shabaab. Al-Shabaab is not an expression of clanism. Al-Shabaab is a negation of Somali culture. Al-Shabaab wants to create a vision of Somali society that is simplified, brutalized, and non-democratic, you see? If Al-Shabaab were to rule Somalia, we would have three million refugees in Kenya in a week. Ambassador, someone who said that Kenya's biggest mistake was to invade Somalia back in 2011. The biggest mistake. That's why Al-Shabaab has been using this excuse to invade Kenya every now and then. What do you think? Was that a mistake? Al-Shabaab and Al-Qaeda, they do not actually leave you alone if you leave them alone. They have been on their attack. Did Kenya invade Somalia for the American embassy here to be bombed in 1998? What about the tourists in Kikambala and the Kenyan workers in that hotel who were killed? Al-Shabaab and groups like this um, do not just stay still. They're like a virus that spreads. And so Kenya was never going to have a situation where we're going to have our democracy, our country, while Al-Shabaab lives. And Al-Shabaab had been attacking us. And so it would have been a disastrous mistake for us to sit and wait for them to strengthen, to weaken the resolve of Somali people to rule themselves so that they could gather their strength and attack us. Now. The coalition government that agreed to our 2011 incursion was a bipartisan grouping of people. In fact, today, largely speaking, the government, people in government and people in opposition, most of them were still leaders in that coalition government. And they sat down and said, as Kenya, we're going to go there. The reasons for going there are still there. Al-Shabaab is not yet finished. And if actually the KDF does not chase them and destroy them alongside other forces, mm. the, all they will do is take root, strengthen, and attack us even more viciously. Okay, do you agree? That, 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 that Defense is, forces should be withdrawn. Yeah, sh no, they should be withdrawn. That is why I'm saying, first we must understand, despite our, great, our greatest respect for General Naikasari, we must, Kenyans must come to one resolve that we are dealing with a long-term problem. Mm. And our political class, whether in the opposition or in Jubilee administration, they must close ranks. Because it doesn't matter even if today, by any stretch of imagination, Kalonzo was the president. I said stretch of imagination, but I don't even believe we'll ever be a president. <laughs> okay, okay, that's a long stretch. Yeah. Even if you are to stretch that, yeah. or even the likes of uh, Tangura, or for that matter, the, uh, the bull <laughs> was to become a president. <laughs> the problem that we are dealing with here yeah. will not escape. No. This is a long-term problem. And the sooner all Kenyans 
particularly the leadership class who wants to play football by thinking that if they came to power today, they will fix it. No, this is a long-term problem that has been with us. Okay, the instability of Somalia to begin with, which has caused the inbreeding or the breeding of the Al Shabaab and Al Qaeda. All right? How well, long? How long? Nineteen when? Nineteen ninety is when. Uh, Siad Barre. Siad Barre. Yeah, fled. Left. Isn't it? Yeah. Now, from that time, and even before then, there were problems in that country. Mm. Now, we have become the nation that has to hold the baby called Somalia. And Kenyans must realize, henceforth, we have to be vigilant as a people. Because that baby has grown up. Because that baby is with us. There are some people who are born here as refugees, but they are married, and they have got children, all right? And therefore, the problem that is going to be with us here is generational. Gentlemen, let's take a break and come back, and let's switch gears, because um, there's a very important ruling in the ICC this week. Ben Suda's plea to have the case against President Kenyatta adjourned indefinitely was thrown out. Let's talk about that. And also, you'll talk about the opposition. The opposition is actually still asking for the president to resign. What's that about? Let's tackle that when we come back. Jeff Kanenga Live coming to you from La Prunia Dora restaurant at the Intercontinental Hotel. We are delving deep into the state of the nation. You can't get guests like this anywhere else when KK Karanja Kapaga shows up and throw in Ambassador Martin Kimani as well. We're talking intellectuals. Spell that. JKL takes a break. We'll be back in a moment.